much. Good morning, everyone. So this morning I spent, spent the morning at Haskell wearing my racket mask. Earlier in the week, we were trolling the type theorists, telling them I want extensionality, which they all hate for various reasons. <laughs> and today I'm going to tell you about uh, some of the work I've been doing and I'll tell you why macros are just not enough. So by the end of the conference, I hope everyone's mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about language-oriented programming in Racket. Uh, but I'm going to start with a question. So do you have any problems in your life, in your computers, any engineering problems that would be simplified if designing and implementing languages was really easy? No, nobody has that problem. I see a couple of head nods. Well, recently I had this problem. I wanted to implement about 120 interpreters. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm teaching an undergraduate compilers course. And I had a, a test suite. It was very fragile, though. Uh, I had syntactic unit tests, which are fine. They work OK, unless like the students optimize things differently than I expect or rename variables differently than I expect. Uh, so this was very fragile. I had end-to-end -end tests, which are great. Those work fine, um, except they don't tell you which pass is failing. They just tell you the compiler is broken. So what I wanted was interpreters for every intermediate language so I could run the interpreter, uh, compile, run the interpreter, know what the true value is. Uh, this would give me a nice robust testing suite. I have all the ground truth values, but uh, I have a nanopass style interpreter, so I have lots of intermediate languages. And because it's a teaching context, we sort of gradually build up the compiler, gradually changing the language. So I sort of have this nanopass times the number of milestone number of interpreters. So we could solve this problem with language-oriented programming. This is a technique that's been developed in the Racket community. And the idea is we want to sort of uh, reuse as much of the language as possible. That would let, you know, that, that approach lets me embed a language into Racket. Um, but it's also it's all been oops, sorry. It's all been developed for high-level languages, DSLs. So we could use this approach if language-oriented programming works very well for low-level languages, as well as it does for high-level languages. So this was sort of my thought going into this project. So the takeaways from this talk are, I'm going to talk a bunch about language-oriented programming. So how do we design a bunch of interpreters using language-oriented programming for this family of low-level to high-level compiler intermediate languages? They all have to interoperate, whole spectrum of them. And how to do this in Racket in particular. So for the talk, I'm mostly going to focus on one and three. I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea of uh, some of the abstractions I implement with this technique, but I'm mostly going to focus on how to implement interpreters in this style and in Racket in particular. Uh, if you want to see more details about how to implement all of these low-level abstractions in this way, see the paper for more details. OK, so let's get started. Suppose I have a little imperative language like this. Uh, this is a little low-level assembly language. It's basically parenthesized x86 with like one instruction, I think. Uh, two instructions, maybe. So a, a program is a list of effects. My effects either set a register to a 64-bit integer or set a register to a binary operation on integers. Uh, I've got a handful of, of binary operations, and I've got all my registers. How would you write one interpreter, interpreter for this language? Well, we're all here ICFP. So you know we're going to do some normal functional pattern, like write a fold over the syntax of this tree, uh, probably do some environment passing to keep things functional. And we'll just pattern match on each effect, interpret it by, say, setting a register in this uh, environment. So if I see the binary operation, I interpret the binary operation somehow. I dereference the register. I, I interpret the operand. So either I dereference the register or I have an integer literal. And then I update my dictionary. And then I just fold over the list of effects. Right? And then I'm going to assign some value to the top level program by dereferencing RAX. This comes from uh, whatever calling convention, I, I think the system V API. So that works OK for one interpreter. But how am I going to do this for 120 interpreters? Right? I'm not going to do that um, because that would be unmaintainable. Like these languages are changing. I'd need to arrange for a lot of code sharing. So I can't do it that way. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to implement any languages. I'm going to implement each language feature by local and compositional embedding into my host language. That way, I can kind of derive all of the languages by taking all of these language features, composing them together to form a language, and from that derive an interpreter for any particular language. 
So this is sort of the approach that the Racket folks have been calling language-oriented programming. We want to build up these individual language features and compose them. And I'm going to show you how this, this sort of differs from just using macros. So I can write the same interpreter just using macros like this. So I want to implement my registers. What I could do is define a mutable hash to give me a model of my registers. So here I have, my, uh, I have a mutable hash. And what I would do is I would model setting the registers by a, di a mutable dictionary update. So I set RAX just by setting the uh, environment with the key R uh, RAX and some value. And then I model referencing the register by a dictionary reference. Now, this gives me a sort of model of the registers, but it's not the right syntax. So macros come to my rescue to give me the right syntax. The way the, re the registers appear in this language, they only appear in setbang. So I'm going to write a setbang macro that expands to this model of registers uh, so that my syntax matches what I have in my source language. But it's modeled using the, the operations we just saw. So if I see a setbang, so here I have defined syntax. It's defining my macro, takes in the syntax object, parses it. It starts, so uh, I hope everyone here is familiar with macros. But if you're not, the syntax, uh, the, the macro receives its entire call. So it starts with the actual syntax of the identifier. And then it has a whole bunch of random syntax after it. We don't know what it is. In this case, we're parsing it. And we expect a register. Uh, and we expect the, the two forms of this set bang, so either a binary operation or some arbitrary operand. And then we're going to generate a syntax object. So this is. We're generating runtime code. And the runtime code is going to update our mutable dictionary. We're going to quote this register so it turns from a raw piece of syntax into a symbol. And then we're going to just embed our binary operation as the underlying host language's binary operation, right? So this syntax for plus is still the syntax for plus. We don't have to interpret it like we did with symbols. Uh, and then we have to do some interpretation of our registers, because our registers are, need to turn into dictionary uh, references. OK. So this gives us the syntax we want. Uh, and then we have this little helper macro, interp opend. So because we expect our registers only appear in a couple of places here, and because we need to generate dictionary references, we wrap any place that might contain a register with this little macro. And it expands to a runtime reference to uh, the dictionary if it's a, an identifier. So here I'm using racket syntax parse, which lets me parse the syntax in a nice way. So this matches, this binds the pattern variable reg if it's an identifier syntax. And then we generate a dictionary reference. Or if it's an integer literal, then we just generate the integer literal. OK, so this gives us the same syntax that we wanted. And now I don't actually have to implement any of the other features, because the other features are shared with the host language. This is the only one I needed to implement. So the pros compared to our, our fold over the syntax, well, this lets us reuse, for example, binary operations from the host language. It reuses begin from the host language. It embeds into the host language. So I can actually interoperate with Racket using this version of setbang. And it's an open set of statements. I could extend the language very easily just by defining new macros. Right? I haven't fixed my set of uh, effects like I did when I had my fold over the syntax, where I had one pattern match with all of the cases. Here, instead, the macro expander is traversing the syntax. and Anytime it finds something that's been defined for syntax, it will call that macro. So I could easily add new things. But the cons to this approach, I'm using macros, but by defining registers as part of setbang, I can't use registers anywhere else in the language. They have to be used exactly in setbang. Right? So I haven't really defined registers as their own feature separate from assignment, which is a little bit annoying. So registers can't be used in any other context. They can only be used in setbang. So I've sort of embedded setting a register into Racket, but I haven't embedded registers into Racket. OK, so this is a sort of macro-based approach. But I want to figure out how to embed them properly into Racket, separate from all other features. That's the more language-oriented approach. And the way we get that is we arrange. We can't do that on our own. We basically need macros that work together throughout the entire system. And Racket has done a lot of work on, on making this happen. So. So here we have a we expect all, all our registers to appear here and here, here so that we can set them here so we can reference them. And we need to figure out how to separate them from setbang itself, from that, that syntax for setbang. So intuitively, what we would like is to model a register as a global mutable variable, right? 
we should be able to define them. So Rax is just a defined variable initially uninitialized to you know, some value. And we should be able to set bang it using set bang. And when we reference it in any context, get its value. But we can't do this directly in Racket. If we tried to do this uh, across modules, Racket would complain. You're not allowed to modify variables across module boundaries. So we can't do this. We could use some other mutable data type to reference uh, to represent registers. So for example, we could define our registers as mutable boxes that contain our value. And then we could use set box bang to mutate them across module boundaries. Um, but then when we reference them, we, we get this weird boxed representation. So we have to explicitly unbox them instead. So this representation would work, but now we're in the same problem where this is not the syntax that we wanted in our source language. So we need something that's mutable across module boundaries and some way to make that syntax match uh, the expected register names, right? So rex instead of unbox rex, but also some way for setbang to sort of change into setboxbang anytime you're trying to mutate the register. This, co this, this requires some cooperation between setbang and whatever our implementation of these mutable variables is. So we can do that in Racket. All right, what we're going to do is make each of our registers a identifier macro. So it's a macro that is bound to the name of the register, and it will expand into something sort of different. And what's very interesting about the design of Racket is setbang is aware of these things. Setbang knows about identifier macros. And when it sees that you're trying to set an identifier macro, it will sort of dispatch to some other macro. So setbang is cooperating with some user-defined macro so that you can always extend the syntax of setbang itself. You don't have to define setbang as its own macro. Setbang is already a macro that is open to extension. OK, so the way we do this is we're going to define some boxes. And I'm going to define all of my registers with a, an underscore, separate name. And then to define an identifier macro, we define syntax like we did before. So here we're defining the syntax for RAX. This is our surface language. Uh, reference to the, map, uh, to the register. And the pattern just says when it's a raw identifier, it's not in, operating, not in operator position. It's just on its own, expand to an unbox. Okay, this gives us the ability to use uh, register references anywhere in the, in the program, any, uh, even under extension. But we need a little bit more than this. So this pattern is so common, there's an abstraction for it. Instead of manually writing out the, the macro and parsing everything, we can define a variable like transformer and just give the body. So instead of pattern matching on anything, we just say, define a variable like transformer and give me what it expands to in reference position. But this takes a second argument that cooperates with setbang. So this gives us the ability to define these in reference position. And it takes this second argument, which is a, a local macro that setbang will call whenever this appears on the left hand side of a setbang. So when it's in reference position, we expand to an unbox. When it's in setbang position, we get the whole syntax of setbang. We don't actually care about this operator. We don't care about this rex. We actually know it's already rex. And we only care about this right-hand side. So we expand to a setbox bang of our mutable box with that right-hand side. Now, compared to our previous implementation, we haven't defined setbang. We haven't fixed the syntax of setbang anywhere. We've isolated the definition of registers just to this macro, right? Well, I, we've isolated the definition of rex to this macro. So we get a lot of use out of variable like transformers in the, in the rest of the implementation. This is sort of the key idea. We want to isolate each feature in this way. And there are a handful of good racket abstractions for that. And in particular, this make variable like transformer abstraction, we get a lot of use out of because it turns out there's a lot of assignable things in compiler intermediate languages. But there's a handful of places where this doesn't work well. And we go over that in the paper, some places where this abstraction doesn't work particularly well, particularly around pointer arithmetic, because this is a compound structure. It's not just an identifier on its own. It's, it's made up of a register and, say, uh, an offset. So we have to hack around it in those cases. But in a bunch of cases, this variable like transformer lets us just reuse the existing racket uh, setbang and extend it with this ability to have different kinds of mutable variables. OK, how am I doing? OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about one other feature, not so much because the implementation of it is interesting, but 
because it interacts with other interesting features of uh, the language extension system. So this is a very low-level language. We have uh, labeled code and jumps. So for example, we can write begin, and we can have these with labels, which introduce a label that you can jump to. Right? This is just a parenthesized version of labels and go to. And oops, the way we implement this is we basically expand into uh, a call. We expand all of these labels into a let rec bound procedure. And we expand all of our jumps into a call. And the call must never return. So implicitly somewhere, we capture the current continuation. And we arrange so that after a series of jumps, you always jump to that continuation. So you can never return from any one of these let, bound, uh, let rec bound procedures. The base, this is the basics of the expansion. It's not very interesting. But what's very important is that we insert this let ec somewhere so that we have the top level continuation. And when the whole program is done, we can jump to the end of it. And we arrange this by following some calling convention. So basically, this continuation gets stored in the return address register. And it's always uh, executed as the final, either at the end of a begin block, or if we have procedures in the language, it's the final thing you return to to get back into the runtime system. And so if we're going to interoperate with Racket, we need to make sure anytime we enter Racket, this let EC gets, gets inserted. And this done box, which contains our, our exit continuation, gets initialized. And there's a couple of places that we sort of enter Racket. We can enter Racket at the top of a module. And we can enter Racket at a, a REPL, so when we're interacting on the REPL. And what Racket does is it gives us the ability to extend these points with sort of these non-syntactic macros. So module begin is implicitly wrapped around every module. And this is very important so that we can write our let ec. We do whatever it is in syntax. That will continue getting evaluated. But first, we store our exit continuation. And similarly, anytime we enter the REPL, we create a new continuation. We have to use let cc here for technical reasons. We store that, and then we continue our uh, evaluation in the REPL. And then by the end, it'll jump sort of back to the, the top of the REPL, and nothing can return. So these non-syntactic uh, non macros, these, I think uh, Racket calls them interposition points, let us uh, interpose on sort of semantic concepts that aren't syntactically apparent in the language and are very important for interoperability. Oh, I had some animation there. OK, so those are, the, those are sort of uh, two important aspects. The last one I want to talk about is how, once we have all of these macros set up, how do we actually define all of the interpreters we want and the interfaces to those interpreters? So Racket's module system is really key here. A module in Racket is, is almost a first class object. We can define uh, a module, define its sort of base set of identifiers in uh, the second operand, and some name for the module in the first one. And Whatever the module provides essentially becomes a new language. So here, I'm saying I want to provide the REX register. right? That's our register feature. And that's, on, that's coming in from wherever we defined it. Everything else here, begin, set bang, plus, uh, minus, star, and this, this non-syntactic thing, this gives me integer literals, is coming from Racket. It's, it's coming from my base set of ident and identifiers. And those are the only things I'm going to provide. And this language one gives me the same language that we, we saw earlier. This set of identifiers that I'm exporting becomes my language. And I can use this uh, module as a language in, in various ways in Racket. And in what, one way we can do that is by passing the module as its own namespace to eval. Then any syntax I pass to eval under this namespace, this derived namespace, is evaluated in an interpreter for the language we just defined. So I still have to write this about 120 times uh, to get these 120 modules. But then I can just reuse Racket's eval, composing all of my identifiers that I've defined into these module languages. And I have all of the interpreters. So this base.rkt is about 600 lines of code, defines all of the embedding for all of the languages. And then I just have all of these, uh, I just reuse eval as all of my interpreters. In a couple of places, I want to sort of expose different interfaces. So I can do that using this module system. So here, I can define my first interface just by defining this language with my set of identifiers. 
and I can provide it as its own interpreter. So here I'm using rename out, and I'm saying uh, this interpreter, it will just take in the code, won't do any checking, and it will just run the code. But I also want to provide some uh, additional checking to make sure my students provided me uh, the right syntax, the syntax I was expecting. So I can separate, say, you generated bad syntax from you generated a program that produces the wrong value. So I expose multiple things. And I don't have to define multiple functions. I can reuse the contract system in Racket for this by defining one interpreter and exposing multiple interfaces to it. So I expose this unsafe interface by renaming it to something else on output, but also by providing it with a contract. So this dynamic check is wrapped around the version of this interpreter that's exported here, where I check that the syntax is valid and I check that I return an integer so that I check I find any bugs in my own code. Uh, that way I can get multiple interfaces to all of these uh, interpreters. OK, so the module system is, is very important here. So there's a bunch of other stuff in the paper. I go through uh, an introduction to racket macrology in the paper in, in more detail. But I also talk about a lot of the embeddings of these compiler intermediate languages into racket. So you can go through those if you're interested in how to get interoperability between these kind of low-level languages, or there might be some insight to be gleaned about the semantics of these things. Um, I have the embeddings for uh, memory pointers and pointer arithmetics of stacks and the procedure stack frames. I have different scoped mutable variables, and I give the interpretation of like various intermediate points and register allocation. I also have custom procedures. So we define our own procedures, which are slightly different than Racket's. Um, and Racket has a bunch of runtime interposition on data structures that are very useful there. There's a handful of things that I totally failed to embed properly. So when I, when I first started talking, I wanted to, I, I wanted to uh, embed each feature separately. There are a couple places where we just don't seem to have the right abstractions yet to separate uh, two language features in a nice way. And I talk about that. And the last thing I, I sort of noticed, and I discussed this a little bit in the paper, is that when you're trying to embed your language this way, trying to embed each language feature separately, you end up uh, sort of trying to design a better language. Anytime you fail to design a macro that can do this compositionally locally without interacting with all the other features in your language, you I, I sort of found myself in one of two situations. Either I don't have the right abstraction, that's this, this set setting, or two, um, the abstraction in my, my object language, the language I'm trying to model, is bad. Uh, this happened with some of these mutable variables where I, I realized that, well, I could redesign the language to declare scope, and then this embedding would be trivial, but I hadn't done that. Uh, OK, so all of that's in the paper. It's online. Um, there's a bunch of links to the code if you want to walk through that. But my main takeaway is we can design lots and lots of families of interpreters interacting uh, languages using the style of language-oriented programming. We try to embed each language feature separately locally into the language. Um, and then we can derive new families of languages uh, from that. And I've talked a little bit about how to do that in Racket. Thank you.